Okay, I have uh, about 12.32. I'm sure there's going to be more tuning in, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, so first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to this month's Research Ethics Consortium in the uh, Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics. I'm Bob Trug, and I'm the director of our center. And today we're going to be exploring the new research, research rigor, reproducibility, and responsibility effort at uh, Harvard Medical School, what we call the R3 initiative. And together we're going to be exploring questions such as who is responsible for ensuring responsible research practices in the academic setting? Is it the individual researcher, the laboratory leader, the department chair, the university, journal editors, or somebody else? Second, we're going to look at what factors lead to breaches in responsible research. And then third, examine where the line is between questionable research practices and outright research misconduct, and what are the best approaches for preventing such practices. The session today will be led by Professor Alexa McRae. Dr. McRae is Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and at BIDMC and an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Her research focuses on the significant problems that persist in the dissemination and exchange of scientific information in biomedicine and health. She is the co-founder of the HMS Department of Biomedical Informatics and is a PI on the NIH-led Undiagnosed Diseases Network, a program that seeks to provide answers for patients and families affected by undiagnosed conditions. And she recently led a National Academy study entitled Open Science by Design, Realizing a Vision for 21st Century Research. She will be joined on the panel by Dr. Mary Walsh, who is a member of the HMS Office of Academic Integrity and a special advisor to the R3 project. And to complete the panel of speakers, we're also welcoming Dr. Jim Gould, he is director of the Office for Postdoctoral Fellows at the Medical and Dental Schools, where he creates professional development programs for all of the school's postdoctoral trainees. So for those of you in the audience today, you're going to have uh, two ways to participate in the discussion. You have the chat box where you can communicate with our panel and each other, and I'll be keeping an eye on that and, and suggesting comments or questions uh, to our panelists. Also, if you have any technical issues today, uh, uh, Julie will be uh, monitoring that as well and, and can help with, uh, with technical problems. Um, but we also have uh, the raise your hand option at the bottom. And uh, after the formal presentations, uh, we'll open the floor for discussion. And you may raise your hand using the Zoom feature at the bottom of your screen. And uh, when called upon, you may unmute yourself and ask a question or make a comment. So without any further delay, let me turn it over to, uh, to uh, our three panelists. Thanks very much, um, uh, Bob. Um, so today, um, as, as Bob said, we're going to be talking about what we call R3 at uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, and we've uh, we've uh, uh, Bob has already nicely introduced us um, to the group. Uh, so the outline, um, uh, Jim, for the we can have the next slide. Yeah, the outline for the talk is uh, just to you know uh, let you know what exactly we mean by uh, rigor, reproducibility, and responsibility. So we'll be defining some of our terms, and I'll give a little bit more background um, on the effort. Um, and then Mary, uh, well, I'll turn the talk over to Mary, who will talk about um, some of the work that she and others have done in uh, looking at what are some of the themes in R3 that we have um, found in our community through a variety of methods, through, me uh, through surveys, through meetings, um, um, and so forth. Then uh, Jim will follow up by talking about our education and uh, training work uh, at HMS in R3. And we'll round out the, um, the talk with our mission statement. And as Bob has already listed, uh, some of the ethical questions that we can um, discuss as a group uh, once the formal presentation is over. 
Um, so what do we mean by rigor? Uh, rigorous and transparent research practices. These are methods and practices that support the confirmation and validation of research uh, findings. Um, that is supported by uh, doing reproducible and replicable research. What we mean here is that this is research that's conducted and shared, importantly, and shared, such that others can obtain consistent results using the same methods and conditions of analysis. And I'll go into slightly more detail um, about this in a few minutes. Responsible science is research that is conducted and communicated transparently, fairly, honestly, respectfully, and in accordance with established research practices or norms. And um, we work to guard against research misconduct and questionable research practices. So what do we mean, and it's not just us, what does the community mean by research misconduct? This is the official definition of the Health and Human Services Office of Research Integrity. And most of you know this, but I thought it would be worth um, just reviewing it. Uh, so the, the characteristics of research misconduct, uh, there are three of them. One is fabrication. That's where you make up your data or results. Um, and, uh, and recording or in, in recording or reporting them. Falsification is where you manipulate research materials, equipment, or processes, or change or omit data or results such that the research is not accurately represented in the uh, research record. That's falsification. That is where you're manipulating uh, your research materials and, and so forth. And plagiarism is familiar to everyone. It's the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. So it's fine to, uh, to cite other people, but you absolutely need to give credit. Um, and, and I think it's important for us to note that research misconduct doesn't include honest error or differences of opinion. So that um, people can make mistakes and there certainly can be differences of opinion, but that's not uh, that is not part of what is the uh, officially seen as research misconduct. Questionable research practices are ones that are um, likely much more prevalent than outright uh, research misconduct. And we thought this would be a nice quote to put up um, from an article written uh, way back in 1994 by Doug Altman, a statistician. He says, what then should we think about researchers who use the wrong techniques either willfully or in ignorance, use the right te techniques wrongly, uh, misinterpret their results, report their results selectively, cite the literature selectively, or draw unjustified conclusions. And he says we should be appalled. And he points out that numerous studies of the medical literature in both general and specialist journals have shown that all of the above phenomena are common. And, and he notes that this is surely a scandal. And lest you think that this uh, you know, is very old, it is of course uh, an, early, uh, an early study, an early uh, actually editorial, um, uh, that in fact, questionable research practices are, uh, are uh, continue to be quite prevalent. There was a study recently done in the Netherlands, a 2022 study that did a survey of thousands of researchers um, uh, within the Netherlands. And the result was actually somewhat shocking that you know, a very high percentage of, of researchers admitted anonymously, but admitted to engaging in uh, one or more questionable research practices um, in the last three years. Uh, so this is certainly an issue that, um, uh, that is still um, uh, in, in front of us and one that we would like to be able to address. Um, so then um, we wanted to uh, uh, let you know that um, there's actually quite a lot of work going on in the um, national and, um, and, and global community. So there, for example, there have been um, a number of, of surveys uh, run by, uh, by nature and have been reported. There's one in, in 2017 and one in 2018. They continue to do a number of surveys um, in various areas, but these are uh, related uh, closely to our three um, issues. So the, um, the love-hurt relationship, um, the one that was reported on in 2017, was a global survey, survey 
of about 5,700 PhDs around the world. About a quarter of them listed mental health issues um, in, the, um, in the work and in, in the laboratories that they were part of. Um, they found that the work could be quite stressful and were questioning, you know, is it worth it? In other words, will it pay off to continue to stay in, uh, in research um, and uh, in academia? Um, uh, one of the other results of this survey was the um, many people commented that mentorship is key, good mentorship is key um, to a healthier um, lab environment. The 2018 survey um, was um, of approximately 3,000 sci scientists um, uh, around the world and um, reported, many reported that laboratories tend to be stressful, toxic, tense, and that there is pressure to produce a particular result. Um, two, uh, two efforts within the, uh, within the UK, I think, are worth um, mentioning. The UK Royal Society um, initiated a two-year program where they ran a number of workshops and meetings and so on um, on research culture, which they defined as behaviors, values, expectations, attitudes, and norms of the research community. And um, they spent a lot of time discussing um, how to uh, effect positive change and pointed out that you both need to have top-down um, and bottom-up approaches. So top-down being what can research institutions do, what can funders do, and so forth. Um, and uh, bottom-up, what, what is it that researchers themselves can do? It's, it's a, a study worth looking at. Uh, then the, the Wellcome Trust um, it did a survey of thousands of researchers, investigators across the UK, and they they found appropriately that, and what we all believe is that most researchers are passionate about what they do. They love what they do. However, um, there is a high level of stress, um, unhealthy competition, and job insecurity are some of the areas that they pointed out that make it um, difficult to do their work. Uh, the director of the Wellcome Trust on, on receiving this report said, these results paint a shocking portrait of the research environment um, and added um, that poor research culture ultimately leads to poor research. So we do want to avoid uh, a poor uh, research culture. So this is just to let you know that there's quite a lot of work going on. And these, this is just a very small sample of um, some of the studies and surveys, um, there's a, a robust literature in this area. Um, so uh, then the next, um, uh, uh, next thing we wanted to point out was that the National Academies um, are taking this quite seriously and have had a number um, of um, relevant studies um, starting about five years ago now with the first highly influential study, uh, Fostering Integrity in Research. Um, and this was a 2017 study. Um, they have a, a quite helpful best practices checklist for, uh, for institutions about how you can best uh, foster research integrity um, in the research setting. Um, uh, they, they start out by saying that it's very important for the institution uh, to demonstrate that fostering research integrity is a central priority at all levels, including for faculty and for institutional leaders. <clears throat> the Open Science by Design uh, report that Bob already mentioned um, it was a report where we looked at how can we um, make it easier for people to share their data? Because as, as many of you know, there are now mandates, and they might think of them as incentives uh, to share data, to make um, uh, research more openly available. And um, our, our study uh, uh, pointed out that if you uh, start by, uh, by uh, using and implementing open science practices right at the beginning of your research, and then you continue to do that throughout the research life cycle, by the time you get to the end of the study, um, your, your data and your methods and all and should be very easily 
shareable. I like to say it's you know almost be like pushing a button that says, uh, okay, now share my data because of the way that you've collected your data, the way you've reported on your data, and so on. So that was one of the uh, primary, uh, that was the primary point of, of that study. That was followed very quickly by a reproducibility and replica replicability in science um, study uh, also done by the academies. And uh, the contribution, among other contributions, of course, of this study um, was that uh, uh, sort of clear definitions of what's meant by reproduce reproducibility versus replicability. So they defined reproducibility as being computational. That is obtaining consistent computational results when you're using the same data, the same computational steps, the same methods, code, and conditions of analyses. So of course you can only do this, with this definition of reproducibility, you can only do uh, reproducible studies if you have access to the data, if you have access to the, um, to the uh, methods and so on. Uh, and that's distinguished from replicability where um, you're obtaining consistent results, but most likely um, using new data, your own data, uh, but with the same methodologies and so on. The um, uh, very recently in uh, 2021, um, the National Academies, under the leadership of Marsha McNutt, who some of you may know, she is the president of the National Academies, but she was also um, the editor in chief of science. And um, uh, she and colleagues established this strategic council for, um, uh, for research excellence, in integrity, and trust. And um, this is an ongoing effort. Um, they've already had five meetings since October of 2021. Um, when their first meeting was about trust in government and uh, um, through scientific integrity, and you know, importantly, through evidence-based policy making. Um, the second meeting was about improving the experiences of early career scientists. We've already heard a lot about um, laboratory environment and, and uh, what early career scientists and all actually all scientists are experiencing. Uh, the third meeting was on uh, misinformation and uh, measuring. How do you measure rigor? How do you get at, uh, how can you make this, this whole process more evidence-based? The fourth meeting brought in funders and said, well, what, what, what's the role of funders here? What can they do? And finally, the fifth meeting, which was just held um, last month, was a discussion about the Office of Science and Technology Policy Memorandum, which was an um, update of earlier the memorandum of 2013, uh, which requires uh, public access to publicly funded research. In particular, they strengthened um, that original memo of 2013 and are now requiring that by the end of 2025, that all publicly funded research um, needs to be made uh, openly available, not only the publications, but also the supporting data uh, by um, the end of uh, 2025. Um, so uh, then next, um, I want to turn now to, so I wanted to give you uh, uh, something about the, you know, the national, the international background uh, context for all of this work. Um, the, uh, the HMSR3 uh, effort uh, was initiated in 2019 when uh, Dean George Daly, the Dean of the Harvard Medical School, uh, in recognizing the importance of R3 principles in practice, uh, formally initiated the effort. Uh, the effort since then has involved many faculty and administrative partners from across Harvard Medical School and its affiliate institutions. Those of you who are not um, at Harvard uh, Medical School may know that um, there is the, um, the basic science research, the preclinical pre research, some of the social science research that goes on um, at Harvard Medical School proper, uh, but there is uh, quite a lot of um, extensive research that goes on in our affiliated institutions. And we are all um, members of Harvard Medical School. So we wanted to be sure to include um, the, um, uh, the broad, our broad constituency. So we've had multiple retreats and committee meetings uh, led by uh, my, my close colleague, uh, David Van Vactor, Davy Van Vactor, who's professor of cell biology and is an expert in um, uh, responsible conduct of science and uh, training for the responsible conduct of science, both um, at the PhD level and beyond, uh, and um, as well as 
looking at how can you uh, how can this work that is uh, the 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 training and the education that happens uh, for uh, for uh, PhDs for students for uh, postdocs postdocs and other trainees how does that translate into the laboratory setting and I think Jim will have a little bit more to say about that in a few minutes he'll certainly be talking about uh, some of our um, educational and training activities and then I chaired a committee on um, on scientific culture and had multiple meetings uh, with very, very good um, uh, interactions of uh, faculty members from across our HMS-wide community. And I want to emphasize that the focus of this effort, the focus of the R3 effort, is on continued research excellence of all of our scientists, of our entire community. Um, on fostering the positive scientific environments and also on evidence-based methods to prevent. So the emphasis is on prevention, prevent breaches in scientific integrity. So with that background, I'm going to turn it over to Mary who will tell us a little bit more uh, specifically about um, the work that we've done here at the medical school to date. Thanks, Alexa. Um, so the, the discussion I'll, I'll be um, having with you today uh, refers to data sets that we worked to develop um, from the initiation of the R3 effort uh, and what we um, started to describe as the HMS R3 landscape. Um, as uh, Alexa had mentioned, there was a number of individuals invested in this discussion that were identified across our community um, in 2019. Um, the, the teams were built on academic and administrative partnerships. Um, and a few of these uh, groups I'll refer to during the data discussion, where, um, where we worked to identify areas to explore emerging themes and priorities for um, our R3 effort in moving forward um, from this initial identified group of invested um, decision makers and faculty, staff, students, and postdocs. Um, and all of this information is relevant and, and that the work that we're doing is in, incredibly relevant to all of these communities. And we wanted to think about how to organize our efforts in an evidence-based fashion um, and from where we could derive this information given the expertise that we were starting to align for the discussion. Um, one of the groups uh, is that we'll talk about um, that we, we uh, discussed with and uh, Alexa also referred to is um, uh, our faculty advisory committee um, identified by Dean Daly in 2019 to participate in the development of the R3 effort at HMS. And this is from across our basic and social sciences and our agent SDM, our Harvard School of Dental Medicine appointing department. Another group that I'll refer to is our um, R3 working group. And uh, this group represented subject matter expertise and operational areas of um, our three endeavors from our administrative and academic teams. And so in working with these two, uh, these two groups and uh, the number of individuals in these areas, our, our effort worked to proactively and retrospectively think about reviewing uh, potential R3 aligning data to help guide the prioritization of our efforts and our endeavors moving forward. And the areas that uh, had uh, kind of come to us through our discussions where we identified uh, data collection opportunities from within these groups included uh, data survey work uh, from our HMS students and trainees. And um, this was collected from our graduate students who participate in our Responsible Conduct of Science, RCOS. Um, and this is a competency survey that was done in the fall of 2019. Um, from our postdoctoral community um, on the responsible conduct of research and data management sessions, our CR sessions that were also held in the fall of 2019. Uh, our R3 uh, committee faculty data, where we did a survey, um, a preliminary landscape analysis of our perspectives from our participating individuals in the R3 effort, which was completed in the spring of 2020. And also uh, case evaluation from our Harvard Medical School Office of Academic and Research Integrity, ARI um, office uh, in terms of our discussions of uh, potential research misconduct. And that work was completed in the summer of 2020. So Jim, I think we can move to the next slide. So 
the first discussion, um, the first data set I'd like to review with you is, um, can you just go back to that, that first slide, Jim? That would be great. Um, is the um, R3 committee survey that was done in the spring of 2020. Um, and this was completed with our faculty advisory panel um, and individuals participating in that in the committee discussion. There were approximately 33 individuals that were um, asked to participate, uh, representing voices from across our research community. And we requested them to provide, provide their perspectives and their perceptions of the emerging R3 discussions in the community and why we're getting involved in this and why it's important to us. So some of the questions that were asked to this group um, in the survey included, why are we engaging in this work? What's important to us? What resonates with us in terms of the R3 effort and the discussions we wanna have? Um, what are your perceptions of strengths in this area in our community? Um, perhaps what are some of the weaknesses or gaps that we might have in our community that we can strengthen in terms of these discussions? And ultimately, what might be ideal outcomes from all of this work and where we wanna take this effort and the development of resources and, and training programs in our community? And so um, in the next slide, so basically we focus on, um, for our discussion today, I thought it would be helpful to look at two examples of the outcomes from those survey questions, um, which include one, some of our perceived strengths um, in our community that resonate with us. And as, as you can see from the um, pie chart on the left, certainly there's an, uh, a, a feeling that there are strengths in the expertise of the HMS community invested in this conversation, that we have the subject matter expertise to weigh in on this and it's important to us. Um, certainly that we feel that the institution is committed and, and is recognizing this as, as uh, a challenge that needs to be addressed and um, that there is work to be done with, um, with our entire community in moving this, this effort forward. And that uh, we have a lot of fantastic programs in place um, already for which we can derive um, resources and, and training and development from where we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but we have a lot of great things happening in our community that we can synchronize across and we can pull from in terms of uh, program development, resource development, and training development. Um, and the next slide is um, on the flip side of that and thinking about what our challenges are coming from. And in this um, particular case, uh, some of this will sound familiar given what you just heard from Alexa in terms of the conversation happening nationally as well. There are certainly the same kinds of um, challenges that we're facing in our community in terms of uh, fragmented and siloed organizational structure and expectations in terms of our research practice. A lot of competing priorities or challenges in the environment in terms of what our teams have to manage in the day-to-day -day research work. And certainly that there are gaps in our training and or resources um, for which perhaps the institution or our teams can step in and buttress those. Um, and, and some of the comments also, if you see on the right-hand side, reflect that as well in terms of um, learning how to destigmatize error in our community um, and how important it is uh, to be uh, proactive in terms of correcting our, our work when challenges arise, uh, providing protective spaces to do this kind of work, uh, certainly understanding the intense pressures um, on researchers in this environment while trying to balance all of this, and thinking about um, a lot of the um, disconnection that there may be in terms of our day-to-day um, -day laboratory environments where these challenges arise and understanding how to navigate these conversations and establish resources um, where these conversations can take place. How do we start to bridge uh, these, these gaps uh, through the R3 effort? Um, so I, the next um, data set that we thought uh, was incredibly important to pull from, and this is um, representative of thinking about our student populations. And this is uh, work that uh, was collected and, um, and is currently ongoing, actually, by Dr. Jason Hustis. Uh, he's the director of our student development in the Harvard Medical School Program in Graduate Education. He's also a very active member in the R3 Working Group um, in its development. And um, and involved in leading and developing the responsible conduct of science uh, content for our uh, graduate students. And Jason felt that um, he had some really rich survey work that he had started to do with the graduate student population. Um, and in particular, 
there was a graduate sur student survey that um, he had performed in the fall of 2019 amongst uh, incoming graduate doctoral students. Um, these are the G1 uh, students that were surveyed uh, starting one month before the start of their fall semester in 2019 and closed out at about the uh, end of the first week of class. There were approximately 144 students included in the analysis um, that had completed the entire survey. And so this represents approximately 60 to 65 percent of the incoming graduate student class. And so um, while the survey wasn't designed to collect information on R3, a lot of our retrospective analyses were um, looking back at what the data we had in hand from our subject matter teams, subject, subject matter expertise teams, and mining that with a perspective or a lens for our three aligning uh, themes. And what Jason was able to do was um, he evaluated a number of competencies across the graduate student class and he worked to bin them. Um, so he looked at 67 competencies of incoming, uh, in, incoming research areas for the graduate students align those in four bins, and then he started to subgroup those in sub bins, including those for critical thinking and research skills. And then ultimately within that critical thinking and research skills group felt that we could drill into a little bit more of individual R3 related skills um, and assess some of the perspectives, the self-identified uh, competencies for the graduate students incoming in this program. And Overall, some of the across all skill areas, what uh, what was found was that approximately one in three incoming graduate students were um, not even moderately confident in many of these skills across the board. Um, and approximately 70% report that they are moderately confident in less or less in all of these areas. Um, but in thinking about the uh, critical thinking and research skills, um, and Jim on the next slide, we there's a visual of how uh, Jason and his team were able to uh, drill into this, uh, into these data, where at the top of the screen, you'll see the color coding as to percentages of the um, self-reporting confidence in these areas, where the lighter colors are, where you're seeing somewhat confidence, and the darker areas up to black on the far side, you're seeing extreme confidence, representing 100% of responses in these areas. Um, and ultimately, they were binned into these um, three bins in the R3 area of critical thinking, quantitation and computational literacy, and research skills. And in the research skills area was a, a place where um, Jason worked to drill down and think about individually where some of these items were in terms of um, R3 aligning skill sets. And, um, and three of those areas kind of rose to the surface in terms of um, some of the reporting data, which include experimental design, uh, responsible conduct of science, including research ethics, and uh, data management and curation. Um, so Jim, if you hit one more arrow, I think there's one more. Oh. And using electronic laboratory notebooks. So in thinking about drilling down into the, confidence, the reported confidence levels in some of these areas, you can see that there is a wide range of uh, somewhat confident to very confident or extremely confident in certain areas. Um, and then the next slide is kind of the summary of, of this visualized data, uh, which includes that um, the G1 students are apparently um, at the time at which they're reporting at this early stage, less confident in their skills relating to these R3 themes, particularly critical thinking and research skills than in other areas, which includes some of those earlier bins of academic and career management thinking. Um, oh, not as much self-confidence um, with quantitative and computational skills, certainly. A lower overall confidence in data management and data storage, which is a recurring theme that we'll talk about. Um, and a small number of students being extremely confident with experimental design. Um, Interestingly, um, there were a higher number of students at the time that rate themselves extremely confident when it came to the responsible conduct of, of research in the RCOS category. Um, however, this may reflect what students necessarily don't know in terms of the practice and, and responsible conduct of science work because as Jason has followed some of this information over time, um, he saw a pattern where the confidence declines uh, in this area as students progress through their graduate student training. So looking at later students uh, in the G1 classes. Next. Bob, you have a hand raised. Yep. 
I was just experimenting with the uh, the hand raise function so that <laughs> I worked. could I could recognize when when people are raising their hands uh, during the discussion. Sorry, I'm just it, just it playing with the technology. Not a problem. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah. Effective training opportunity. Um, so the next set of data um, is reflective of work that was collected from our uh, postdoctoral population and. Um, I'm going to summarize it, but I have a, a subject matter expert here with me. Uh, this is part of uh, Jim Gould's team in terms of the responsible conduct of research courses that he routinely um, has with and for postdoctoral students um, that cycle throughout the, the academic year on a, on a regular basis. And in this particular um, session that was completed in the fall of 2019 was focused on uh, research data management. And uh, this survey work was uh, collected pre and post um, during post uh, pre and during the postdoctoral session on um, research data management and uh, and uh, research data management course. Um, it reflects approximately 60 to 65 percent of the participating postdoctoral fellows in this in this training event. The event was focused on thinking about data management and project planning, data ownership, and materials and data sharing incentives. And this includes how uh, you know, local labs track, uh, record, and store experimental data, reanalysis of data sets, and principles of data access and sharing, such as the uh, FAIR principles, uh, which were first described by Wilkinson et al., um, which include data sets. Um, and corpus of work that are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, uh, again, aligning with our three themes um, that we've seen developing in our community uh, in supporting transparency and utility of research data for building on experimental findings. And a, a lot of the information that was taken from and the, the emerging themes from this, these conversations included that um, while these principles were aspirational, um, and people were invested in thinking about these, the actual execution of this, these kinds of principles in our day-to-day -day operations are very, are, are much lower. So for example, 70% 70 70 finding this um, certainly worthwhile and something to be invested in. Um, there's actually only 15% of our postdoctoral uh, participants here reporting that these principles are in fact adopted and utilized in our respective fields and our laboratories. Importantly, in, in some of these discussions, um, we're thinking about the discussions of research data management and thinking about the teams that do this work. And um, postdocs are, are reporting um, during these conversations that in thinking about this with their lab leads, their PIs, um, that 72% um, reported in thinking about data management and these principles, um, neither the PI or a lab manager oriented them to research data management um, in their laboratories. And almost half reported that research data management is not discussed actively in the lab at all. Um, and how this may affect um, downstream and day-to-day and -day applications and experimental work, um, at least one in three um, of postdocs were reporting they were unable to find project data, um, and one in four been, have been unable to reproduce results from their own labs. Um, and these number, numbers were the same regardless of whether the work was um, their own work or colleagues that they were um, responsible for in the lab. And so the, the next slide is kind of a visualization of that just to give us a sense for some of these emerging themes in terms of um, research uh, R3 um, discussions in research data management um, in terms of uh, the discussions that PIs are formally having or, or informally having or, or whether or not these, these discussions are happening at all in group settings, uh, which does not seem to be the case. Uh, in our community. So again, another area where we're starting to see um, aligning emerging themes across our data sets. Uh, the next um, set of information that we'll discuss in, in aligning some of our R3 uh, landscape analysis work was done by the Office for Academic and Research Integrity. Um, and I did this work uh, while I was chief scientific investigator. Um, I've now shifted to special advisor for R3. And um, I did this work in partnership with our other senior scientists uh, in forensics at, at, in the Office for Academic Research Integrity. And what we were able to do was um, help actively collect information from our case studies. And we worked to um, identify a set of 
data that from open to close happened, uh, so complete cases um, that were that were uh, happened between a uh, five year period from 2010 to 2015. These data represented approximately 56 and affiliate and 16 um, basic and social science departments. 72 departments in total across our community uh, were the data from where we were able to derive these from. The rates per caseload per all of these across all the departments were similar. Um, there were certainly common themes that we'll hear about again that, that emerged from this data set, including challenges in data management, data analysis, practice, mentorship, or supervision. Um, and these themes um, aligning with our R3 effort were similar regardless of whether or not research misconduct were found. Uh, so these conversations um, were actively happening and um, were a rich source of uh, information back to our appointing departments with regards to some of these challenges that we see in the R3 environment. Uh, the next slide just breaks down some of the information that we saw in these challenges. Uh, in, in these cases uh, through 2010, 2015, uh, hands down, uh, across the board for all cases, 100% of these cases involve poor practice in scientific data handling and management. And importantly, in, in many of these cases, which confounded a lot of the discussions, were that raw data, the original source data for represented experimentation, were partially or completely absent in at least half of the cases that we, uh, we reviewed and discussed. Um, 56 percent of these cases um, involved poor practice in data visualization, so figure development, representation of the underlying research record in visual figures, um, in published papers, and 38 percent of cases involved poor practice in data analysis, so um, removing data points, um, inappropriately handling, da handling data and or statistical analysis of data sets, and in many cases uh, there, were case there were a number of combined issues in these conversations where both representation and, and visual management of data and the underlying research record and value data um, alterations were uh, significant challenges during these, these cases. Um, and I think the final slide that I have here um, ties into some of the discussions that from all of this information and, and certainly from uh, the emerging themes from our uh, research misconduct um, discourse uh, were tied together very nicely um, by uh, Dr. Dennis Brown, who was invited to come to uh, speak to Dr. McRae's Scientific Culture Committee, uh, Alexa's Scientific Culture Committee. He spoke uh, to that group in 2021 on research rigor, reproducibility, and responsibility experiences and perceptions from HMS and beyond. And his experience comes from his role as a faculty member at HMS. He's an expert in cell biology at MGH, recognized also, however, for his many contributions both at HMS and internationally for efforts in research rigor, reproducibility, and responsibility. Um, in addition to serving on study sections, he also um, was served as the um, APS, the American Physiological Society, uh, where he was editor in chief of the American Journal for Physiology and Cell Physiology um, and served as their 90th uh, president most recently. Um, he also importantly is the director of the MDH Office for Research and Career Development and um, appointed to the HMS Faculty Committee on Conduct. Uh, which serves as a deciding body and a recommending body um, on the, the cases of potential research misconduct that I just discussed with regards to potential um, falsification, fabrication of uh, data in our environment and the recommendations that come out from those conversations um, at the end of discourse. And some of the takeaways that he brought for us and for our, our teams to consider um, involved what we can do both locally as principal investigators um, in our laboratory environment, in thinking about our raw data, how we're having conversations with our teams with regards to data management, um, how, we're produce, how we're approaching practice every day, and thinking about how our, our PIs can be advocates for um, this, these practice pipelines and, and improvement of these practice pipelines to address challenges in R3 that we're seeing in our environment. And then certainly how hopefully our, our institution can think about stepping in um, in addition to um, supporting our core facilities and um, thinking about efforts in data management, 
Um, also thinking about rewarding um, teams and individuals who are invested in these conversations of R3 because it's such a critical component of the success of research excellence and operations in our day-to-day -day environment. Uh, so all of these data that I've just kind of reviewed um, that our team tried to collect um, helped build a framework for consideration of important R3 concepts for our community to consider and build upon. And um, I'm going to turn the discussion now over to Jim uh, for the what those frameworks began to look like uh, based on these conversations. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and as you say, we we now had to actually build a framework for all of the, the data and knowledge uh, and the principles that we have um, uncovered and tried to develop. Uh, we had to actually put them in place. We actually had to build a framework for um, building a program, an initiative, and an effort around. So we were able to identify uh, through the community as well as internal work that there are kind of five major areas of, of R3, uh, research design, data management, analysis, interpretation, visualization, scholarly dissemination, and scientific culture, which ties all of these together with an underlying element of education and training, as well as building um, and, and sharing tools and resources across R3. Um, and, and breaking these uh, this framework out into uh, individual um, work uh, there's research frameworks, hypothesis generation, moving into data management, there's documentation, there's data storage, you know, statistical analysis, validation, pipelines, moving into scholarly dissemination, there's publications, but there's also FAIR principles, data sharing, op sharing open access, moving into uh, scientific culture. You know, it is a cycle, but they each one of these components actually inform uh, everyone else and everything else uh, as part of this framework. Again, underlying education and training and tools and resources within scientific culture, which um, I believe is probably maybe the most important part of this because it's tying a lot of this together and the, the importance of the actual culture in which science is done through leadership, mentorship, responsible, responsibilities, uh, ethics, policy standards, and academic advancement. So we, we had to create this framework in order to place our, the principles and, and landscape analysis uh, in context and be able to, to share it back and, and build programs around it. And in moving into building sort of programs uh, and educational programs around it, there's a, a philosophy that I tend um, uh, to, to use in my postdoctoral training. Uh, there are kind of four major areas in which I concentrate my trainings on making their research better, making their you know, access or writing papers and manuscripts better, their access to funding, uh, maybe more secure or opportunities expanded, or their grant writing uh, that much better, but also um, thinking about and developing their professional, you know, their professional selves as well as their career. And there are kind of three aspects to this training, uh, for these training programs where we, it's relatively easy across all of these uh, sectors to build awareness. You know, we don't, we, we would need maybe a, a 45 minute to an hour workshop or seminar just to build awareness across, you know, research or across all of these uh, elements. But it's even harder and it gets more selective uh, because there's increased time and increased um, uh, expertise needed to build skills uh, within these areas. And then finally, the, the ultimate goal of any type of training is to actually gain experience. And it is very difficult to gain experience across these elements, especially in research, in manuscript writing, grant writing or funding, as well as career development. But this is the holy grail, that, that pinpoint of, of experience. And most of the experience uh, that is developed uh, in all of our training actually happens in the laboratory, not in our trainings, not in our over Zoom, not in the classroom, it actually happens in the laboratory. So we, we, you know, using this training and programming philosophy, we need to bridge the gap from theory to practice for R3, but also bridge the gap from classroom to laboratory, to actually implementation and use of, of R3 principles across all of these sectors. So, you know, again, in, in building, you know, the postdoc training curriculum, but also it, it works as well for our PhD students where we have an asynchronous training timeline. There's an expectation of them to be gaining all of these skills and competencies uh, and trainings 
where they, you know, they're onboarded at orientation. They have an expectation of continuous research progress. There's kind of three phases of their training early where they're just learning new things. There's mid where they're becoming a, a bit more expert, a bit more independent. And then there's late where they're on an independent path, but also then looking for the next step and stage of their career, whether it be post, you know, PhD program to postdoc or PhD program to industry or other, but also postdoc to faculty or postdoc to industry. So we build you know, this community, but also this curriculum around research progress, which happens mostly, I would say 99.9% .9 in the laboratory, but we as a community build professional development opportunities and career planning opportunities. And we were able, we can be able to connect all three of these phases of training through individual development plans uh, with individual trainees, graduate students, and, and postdocs. Um, I believe the, the PhD students, there is a, a, a requirement for individual development planning with between each mentor and, and each trainee. It doesn't, it is not mandatory at the postdoc level, but again, running a postdoc office, I highly, highly recommend doing that. But it, it helps bridge the three phases across, you know, kind of the, the three timelines of training, early, mid, late, across career planning, professional development, and research progress. And as you'll see in this, you know, this um, graphic, RCR, Responsible Conduct of Research, and R3 are part of that professional development, but also is interweaved into research progress. And in developing themselves, uh, our trainees, our PhD students, and our postdocs, they need to be gaining transferable skills that they can take from the laboratory into their professional next stage of their career, but also be able to develop themselves while they are producing rigorous and responsible science. And you know, as a this is a sort of a continuum of transferable skills from hard skills and methods and technologies, quantitative and computational skills into operational experimental design, data interpretation, moving into soft skills, management, leadership teamwork, sort of the personal, interpersonal, human skills that you know we, we tend to just call soft skills. These on the right-hand side, I would argue to, you know, to I'm blue in the face, that these are as important or maybe sometimes more important than some of the skills on the left-hand side. Not because, you know, getting your research skills honed and, you know, becoming an expert is not important in, you know, continuing your career, but you have to do this in the sense of a community and other people in a laboratory. So if you can work with people, it's very important. And I bring this up because R3 principles is not just about getting research done. It's about getting research done in a, you know, in a community. And the National Postdoc Association, the, the NPA, has published their core competencies. And one of the things that I, I wanted to, to bring about is using that, you know, transferable skills continuum from above, their core competencies from the NPA across most of those skills with an emphasis on RCR, an emphasis on discipline specific knowledge, leadership man leadership and management skills, communication skills, professional research uh, skills development, and again, acrossing the entire continuum is professionalism, you know, responsible conduct within uh, the laboratory and, and with the, the personnel that you were working with. And breaking out that you know, the, the circle of the R3 framework and cutting a, you know, sort of linear, linearizing it, you know, across research design, data management, uh, all the way over to research culture, I was able to align the, the general curriculum of the responsible conduct of training that the PhD students receive, uh, as well as the RCR training that our postdocs receive. And I, I'm also the, you know, the program director of our, the RCR program for, uh, for postdocs, as Mary alluded to. So uh, I, I am very familiar with the nine sessions that we offer throughout the year for the, the for the postdoc scientific citizenship, which distinctly sits in the research culture. But you will see, I would say, there, you would see that eight of the nine sessions that we offer in the postdoc RCR are entrenched or anchored in the research culture and then move across the, uh, the R3 framework. The only one that doesn't necessarily touch research culture, but it's very much uh, very close to it, 
is our research data management, which you know you saw some data from a few years ago. Uh, and I think actually one of the attendees is um, one of the, the authors of some of that data. But as you see in the, the RCOS, the Research um, Responsible Conduct of Science that the PhD students take, and they actually have two rounds of RCOS, NG2 and NG6. It's exactly the same course, but they are four years, you know, four years more senior into this process. And uh, the, the, even though the content is the same, the context begins to change. But as you can see, except you know, across these six competencies, these six sessions, again, research culture is very um, you know, an anchor, and it moves across the R3 framework. Um, with the, the exception potentially of, of research design. So I just wanted to, to align our RCR with the R3 framework. And we need to do probably a little bit better job or a, a little bit more work to make sure that we are reaching across the entire R3 framework. And, um, and one of the things that I predict will happen in the future, I don't know when exactly, but the RCR programs, both the PhD program and the, the postdoc program, will become part of the R3 effort in general. And we will better be better, uh, better situated to align both the curriculum across the PhD and postdoc programs, but also the R3 framework. And uh, our colleagues, as uh, Alex has introduced David Vactor, but also uh, a former curriculum fellow, Yelena, as well as our current curriculum fellow, Jade, have developed a uh, a, a framework for our three skills and competencies. Uh, as, as you can see on the screen, based in the, in the center, there's scientific competencies, resources and training, assessment and feedback, uh, uh, progression and evidence. There's a, an entire process that we need to work through as we begin to develop and implement and actually train for these competencies in our three across communication, teaching, mentoring, management, leadership, very similar to the competencies um, that was shown above across the, the National Postdoc Association, as well as the, the um, transferable skills that you know, I try to highlight in our training. Uh, there's career and professional development. Resilience is very important. Low resilience equals low resistance to um, research misconduct. So we need to bolster not just the science, but the scientists themselves. Scientific knowledge, critical thinking, experimental design, experimental skills, data analysis, and responsible conduct of science. To further this, we actually need to build, you know, uh, an actual implement implementation plan. And Yelena and Jade, as well as uh, Davey, have come up with a, a very nice rubric for um, the, the the framework and implementation, where we can take across three phases of conceptual knowledge, operational knowledge, and ap application knowledge, sort of the 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 depth and experience of the knowledge across from novice trainees all the way to potential expertise you know, and expert trainees. Um, and using this framework, we can begin to actually uh, build a, a way to pilot, uh, you know, create ideas, pilot, optimize, and implement in our graduate programs as well as our postdoctoral curriculum, where you know, the pilot would actually take place in our, our BBS program, the Biological and Biomedical Science, PhD program, one of nine, I believe, PhD programs that we have at, uh, at HMS. And you know, within BBS, mostly because Davey Van Vactor is the director of BBS, it's a little bit easier to pilot within that program. And it's actually one of the larger programs uh, across the nine PhD programs. And begin to, to pilot across specific courses, you know, develop specific R3 courses, but also be able to extract R3 principles that are taught across all of the courses uh, in BBS uh, as part of the graduate program. Optimize and align the curriculum, training framework, develop a, maybe even a software platform to track training across our PhD and po postdoc trainees, and then actually implement across uh, the entire HMS training framework, uh, PhD, postdoc, and even beyond. And with that, um, you know, thinking about there's this holistic approach to our training that, that I you know, like to zoom in on actual development of courses and trainings and specific content, but we also need to zoom out and make sure that the, the product that we are trying to put in front of our trainees is as good as possible. So there's this idea of quality improvement through identifying strengths, needs, and gaps, delivering relevant programs, 
in developing, also developing reasonable policies and guidelines, including and serving the entire community and doing it over and over, making sure that the product and content we put in front of our trainees is actual, um, is actually good quality and what we actually want to be sharing. And when we do this, we can begin to measure outcomes of inclusive hiring and recruitment of our students and postdocs, because this will have a positive feed forward effect. We will have supported and satisfied trainees because they are being um, in a scientific culture and community that supports rigorous science, but productive and innovative rigorous research from our trainees, the decreased time to completion, and hopefully current confidence in, a, in their career progression. And sorry, and with that, Alexa, I'm going to bring you back into the conversation to share our mission statement. Well, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you, Mary, for that, um, uh, both of you, for the extensive um, overview of what we've been up to. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight, I think you've already seen this in the um, uh, in, in, in the work that uh, as we were uh, publishing and, and uh, advancing this, uh, uh, this presentation today, uh, but I thought it'd be worth just reading it together. Uh, so Harvard Medical School supports a culture that advances research, rigor, reproducibility, and responsibility. HMS is committed to identifying, exploring, and fostering our three principles and practices relevant to our research community through cross-discipline conversations and collaborations. And we certainly have been doing quite a lot of that already, and we will continue to do so. Uh, then to ensure the continued and advancement of research excellent at a, excellence at HMS, um, the HMS R3 effort identifies opportunities to enhance R3. And what's our focus? With a focus on evidence-based research, institutional support, training and educational programs, and resources and tools for our students, trainees, faculty, and staff. And you've heard about some of that today, and um, there's more work going on that uh, we can um, discuss as we go forward. So uh, if we then take a look at the, uh, we did prepare uh, at, at uh, Bob's request, we prepared a few ethical questions um, and we can discuss those, but we certainly can discuss other things too in the discussion period. Uh, so who's responsible for ensuring our three practices in the academic setting? Um, you know, does it devolve on the individual researcher, the, the leader, the laboratory leader, department chair, university editors and publishers, what's their role, funders, et cetera. Um, what factors lead to breaches in R3 practices, um, and in particular to questionable research practices? What, what are some of the factors that, that lead to, the, to, um, to those? And um, what distinguishes um, what QRPs, questionable research practices, from outright uh, research misconduct? And what's the best approach for preventing such practices, which, which is what we're really all about. Um, incentives, modeling best practices, education and training, sanctions, mandates, and so on. So I think um, we can take the slides down, Jim, and then we can move into um, the discussion period. And maybe we'll start. Um, uh, so Bob, yes, I can see the chat. So maybe I'll just start by answering the first one. Uh, which is um, Harvey Mammon um, says, um, uh, he's talking about the Doug Altman definition of questionable research practices. Um, and he says that they could involve a large gray zone. And absolutely, you're absolutely right. The literature is always cited selectively. And as, as you point out, it's impossible to cite everything. Um, and authors will understandably cite the literature that supports their findings. Uh, misinterpreting results and drawing unjustified con conclusions are both potentially very subjective, easily overlapping with the prior slide about uh, honest differences of opinion. Uh, and, and he goes on to say he's reviewed many manuscripts in which um, he questioned whether the author's conclusions are justified, but would not consider the research questionable. So uh, you're absolutely right. Um, I uh, Maybe I could um, uh, be a little bit more specific about what others have uh, meant by questionable research practices, and in particular, um, the Dutch study, for example, that identified 11 questionable research practices, and, and one of them uh, relates specifically to this question of selectively um, citing the literature. And what they what what the that practice is is just selectively citing references to enhance findings 
or convictions. In other words, to just you know when there's been when there's been a lot of um, disagreement in the literature or there or there are alternative ways of looking at it, so def leaving leaving that literature out uh, and only um, uh, citing the literature that is uh, that's supportive. Uh, some of the other um, questionable research practices um, that are listed there is insufficient attention to the equipment skills or expertise, insufficiently supervised or mentored junior coworkers, inadequate research designs or unsuitable measurements, measurement instruments, unfair, unfairly reviewed manuscripts, grant applications or colleagues, conclusions not sufficiently substantiated, improper referencing of sources, um, inadequate notes um, of the research process, failure to report important study details in the publications, and this is beginning to slide over into uh, research misconduct, um, insufficient inclusion of study flaws and limitations um, in publications. And a more another um, study, um, a report, 2015 by Fiedler and Schwartz, uh, lists some other questionable research practices. Uh, for example, failing to re report all of a study's dependent measures, deciding whether to collect more data after looking to see whether the results were significant. And if they're not, you collect more data. Um, failing to report all of a study's conditions, uh, stopping collecting data earlier than planned because uh, one found the result. It's a, in other words, finding the result that you're looking for, so you stop data collection well. Um, uh, uh, rounding off p-values, uh, selective re selectively reporting studies that worked. If I, we already talked about that, descending uh, deciding whether to exclude data after looking at the impact of doing so on the results. Uh, that's again um, a problem. Um, uh, reporting an unexpected finding as having been predicted from the start, and um, claiming the results were unaffected by demographic variables when one is actually unsure or knows that they do. Uh, so that's just a more, that's rounding out a little bit more. Again, this this quote, we thought it was a, a very interesting quote and from, from quite a while ago um, from a, a statistician who spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this. Um, and then um, uh, Liza uh, Dawson asks whether any of the uh, survey data are published. And Mary, uh, perhaps some of Jason's work has been published. I'm not quite sure. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Hustis um, has been active in this field and um, has certainly been publishing on his uh, competency data and is following up on that as well. Um, ultimately, um, part of the conversation for the R3 effort is thinking about opportunities for us to continue to publish on these data. How do we do this? How do we do this effectively? How do we utilize the data in our community and share it more broadly? And so there are, I think definitely, I think we all feel definitely opportunities for continuing this uh, trend and in, in utilizing this evidence-based approach, but also uh, walking the walk in terms of publishing and sharing that data more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you, uh, Mary. Um, so, and Jake Earl asks, um, like most RCR programs, uh, the, uh, it seems that HMS's R3 efforts focus primarily on PhD students and postdocs. What interventions are you pursuing or considering for improving the knowledge, skills, and most importantly, behaviors of faculty and senior research personnel. This comes up quite often. Um, I'll, I'll let uh, Jim weigh in uh, uh, in a moment, but uh, certainly some of the work that we've been doing, well, we've already talked about uh, making sure that there are ways to transfer uh, what, um, to take what has been learned in the by the trainees into the laboratory setting so that um, the uh, how, are, how are we going to affect that? Well, there are a variety of methods where we can do this. For example, we can, we can use the independent, um, uh, do the uh, development plans, the IDPs uh, to uh, perhaps involve sign off by, um, by uh, faculty, by principal investigators and so on. Uh, but we're doing something actually, and this is, this is the work of uh, Davy Van Vactor, um, again, here at Harvard Medical School, and colleagues on the Simmer, um, uh, Simmer work, C-I-M-E-R -C -I work, uh, which is um, providing formal training um, at the uh, faculty level and, and uh, senior uh, research personnel, as, as you say here. Uh, Jim, did you want to add anything to that? 
Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that you know, I, I want to bring up two points, this is the first point being, this is why we have involved faculty from the very beginning of this conversation, um, understanding that the, the community doesn't move unless the faculty move with it. So we've involved faculty as part of this conversation. And many of these ideas that we have shared um, this afternoon have come from faculty themselves. And uh, Alexa has drafted, Alexa and Davey have drafted a very nice strategic plan to go to Dean Daly from you know, the, the discussion that we've had and the voices of our faculty. So they've been involved in the process of R3. The other thing point I wanted to make is there is an emphasis on our trainees, one being our current trainees will be our future faculty at some point. And if they understand these principles from the very beginning of their training all the way to when they're training others, um, we, we can sort of build that pipeline into, um, into fruition. But as, as uh, Alexa talked about, um, there is a program for our faculty to be trained as better mentors at the very least through the Simmer program, which is the Center for the Improvement of Mentored Re Experiences in Research. Uh, that's based out of uh, University of Wisconsin. But there's also uh, something that, that we need to do a little bit better with is socializing and sharing and updating our policies and guidelines that are already in place for the, um, for not only for research integrity, but also professional integrity for our faculty and everyone else in the research community. So that is something that uh, came to, um, to be highlighted by the new director for professional integrity from the Academic and Research Integrity Office at our most recent RCR session on Wednesday, saying, you know, when she asked the audience of postdocs, not, not faculty, but postdocs, are you aware of this policy? Are you aware of this policy? Are you aware of these resources? And nobody knew about them. So that is a, another issue that we need to, to, to bring to the fore. That's part of this ongoing um, R3 effort. Absolutely, faculty are a focus on this, but right now the implementation and training um, framework that, we, that I shared earlier are already in place. So we are emphasizing trainees at the moment, but we need to actually build a framework for our faculty. I, uh, as Julie noticed here, um, uh, for those of you who would like to make a comment, we can un we can see that if you'll just raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, so uh, please feel free to do that. Alexa, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, it's okay because Bob, this next question is actually for you. Uh, it's uh, about the Masters of Bioethics. So Dr. Wilberforce Musoga Kabweru. Uh, it says Masters of Bioethics is great need in great need of pursuing PhD re in research integrity. Any contacts and opportunities? So I think I'll, I'll turn that over to you and 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 maybe uh, Becca, who isn't on the um, on the call, but yeah. Well, I uh, I would say uh, please reach out to us. We'll we'll respond to you directly by uh, by email uh, with any questions we can provide. Our our website is uh, freely available as well. Our at uh, the um, Master of Bioethics program. So look forward uh, to, to hearing from you. Um, I might just ask a question. Um, you alluded to this issue, but um, something that we, we hear a lot about is the intense pressure on postdocs in laboratories, the, the uh, struggles, uh, some sense financially, the, the, the pay scales and things like that. And, um, how much do you think that kind of pressure um, influences uh, problems with with people, you know, really for almost livelihood reasons, needing to be successful, and and that intense pressure to be successful, leading to to taking shortcuts, and is that an important factor? And and if it is, what are some things that you're doing to to alleviate that? Yeah, uh, so. Uh... Absolutely, uh, you know, some of the um, major challenges, which we haven't talked about too much, but uh, certainly the surveys I alluded to when I talked about some of the global surveys, is that we're living, you know, the challenges in biomedical research today are are, are, are vast. Uh, we're living in, you know, this is an overall hyper-competitive environment. Um, there is, uh, as I think you noted, 
there's an acute need to secure research funding. You have to secure research funding if you're going to be successful. Um, there are considerable and growing administrative uh, requirements that are often driven by federal mandates. And so, you know, you could look at those federal mandates in two ways. You could say, well, they really are incentives for doing the right thing, for sharing data. So there's a new data management plan, for example, at, at the NIH is going into effect at the end of January. Um, and there's there were the mandates from the OSTB, the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, memos uh, to make um, federally funded research publicly accessible. So those are you can see them either as incentives or you can see them as mandates. I prefer to see them as incentives. However, um, that puts a lot of pressure on um, on uh, laboratories and scientists uh, and the researchers within those laboratories. Um, so what is it that we can do? Well, I think we've, we've laid out some of the areas. Uh, for example, uh, mentorship and laboratory oversight. Is it working more closely with your mentor? And as Dr. Brown pointed out when he spoke to us, um, that it is, um, uh, you know, it, 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 uh, the, the, the mentorship issue is key that uh, uh, you need to be able to um, uh, pro provide the appropriate mentorship and oversight in the lab, you know, reviewing the raw data, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe your lab has gotten too big. So these are things to consider. Again, we're not mandating anything. We're, we, we've we spent the last year and a half, two years, collecting a lot of information about our community and doing a lot of listening to what our community is saying. Um, there are, um, you know, there are very few rewards, as Mary said, for, um, uh, for practicing, you know, open science or uh, uh, for uh, pursuing our three principles in a variety of ways. So I think that, um, uh, you know, not pressuring, as Dr. Brown pointed out, not pressuring everybody in your lab to have a, uh, in our world, to have a publication in Nature, Cell, or Science, or perhaps, or perhaps in the England Journal of Medicine, you know, those being the big journals and that if you don't have a publication in one of those journals that you are um you know it's going to have a, a deleterious effect on your um on your future as as a scientist those are all um th those are all uh, 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 negative approaches to um how you build uh, scientific integrity um, you know among your population so again our focus is on being as positive as we can and helping uh, to move the needle. So you, you say, how? Well, by uh, providing lots of resources, by providing tools. We didn't spend too much time talking about our research data management group that's part of this R3 activity, but they have created a number of very excellent tools for people to use uh, in, um, uh, in, in managing their data better. They have, there are librarians on staff, various folks on staff, our research computing staff uh, to help folks. We haven't said much about our cores. We have um, excellent cores throughout the, uh, the, the medical school that provide um, extensive resources uh, to help people do their work. So, our, so to answer your question in, in a word, to try to provide uh, resources, tools, training, education, and a positive outlook on doing science. As one of our as one of our committee members said, all he wants is for his trainees and people in his lab to think of Harvard Medical School, School as being an exciting place to work. And that's what we're all about. And uh, so <laughs> that was a long-winded answer to your question. No, but... I, I wanted to jump in as well, Alexa, and talk about not just the science side of support, but also the human side of support. And uh, Bob, you asked about sort of the, the stress and stressors that postdocs face. Um, I, I think COVID and, and also the recent spate of inflation has laid bare the disparities that some mm -hmm. of our trainees face mm -hmm. and barriers that they face. And it's almost like we need as a community, the scientific community, we need to acknowledge that, you know, we need almost like understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs. 
where we need to understand that our, our trainees, everybody a part of our community, has physiological needs that need to be met that aren't being met. They have safety needs that aren't being met in the laboratory, at home, on their commute. They want to be, you know, feel belonging to the community, which aren't being met. So the three, you know, ba the base three layers of the Maslow's hierarchy aren't being met for our trainees. How are we expecting them to be resilient and actually produce rigorous science without addressing those needs as well. So mm -hmm. just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, I'm sorry. And I noticed that Dr. Cabrera, you have your hand up. So Julie, if you can make it possible for uh, Dr. Cabrera to speak. Yes. Ask to unmute. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know if you still, Dr. Uh, where I still have a question there or or not. I, oh, I see your hand up and I see your, can you unmute yourself and then you'll be able to speak? There you go. Yes, great, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for the, giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, I've been attending these conferences for almost some good time. Uh, with even uh, surgical uh, uh, bioethics uh, conferences that you had earlier on. And my intention, um, first of all, I'm Dr. Kabul Wibakos. I work in Uganda, I'm a surgeon, and I'm a, a bioethics resident second year finalist. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very interested in doing uh, clinical ethics research, but also uh, since I also lecture in Makerere University, I'm very interested in pursuing my PhD in research integrity. I had uh, gotten supervisors to supervise, but then I was looking for the opportunity to, to pursue. I know uh, Harvard Bioethics Center also supports a bit of some programs uh, to Makerere once in a while. But currently, there's no opportunity. That's why I, I posted that. And uh, during his presentation, I realized that actually the focus is about building better researchers from the students that can end up making uh, better um, uh, faculties in the future. Sometimes it's very difficult to start looking for the faculties, yet the young ones whom we are meant to mentor are not well mentored. So. I think the approach would be very good. And I also bore the same idea. Building a young scientist to become a responsible a researcher is easier than mentoring your own mentors. It is a little tough or for the independent researchers or even for institutions somehow, somewhere, it may not be very easy. So I think that approach would, uh, would be very much welcome even in our low income setting whereby students are more dependent on the person who is mentoring them. So if they get someone who is straightforward, transparent, and honest, then it is easier to pick up along those lines, and then you train a uh, very good young mentees who will actually pursue and mature into responsible uh, research. And, and it, there you'll be fostering a responsible conduct of research, and yet and promoting research integrity. Thank you. So I'll be waiting for that opportunity. If it comes anytime, <laughs> I'll be grateful to hear. May God bless okay. all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for contributing. And um, you know, and thank you for joining us. I mean, I, I think one of the uh things we really hope to do with with these seminars is to be able to reach international audiences and, and people like you. So thank you for being here. And I, I hope we can continue to to meet that need. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, I, I'll just follow uh, up to say, just to, to Dr. Quibera's point uh, in terms of how important experiential learning is uh, and to Jim's discussion with regards to how critical that is in the pathway, um, part of this effort is really thinking about the day-to-day -day, um, operations and how we can uh, model uh, in practice what we expect on the other side. So it's a great comment. Thank you, Dr. Quibera. Well, let me say, you know, where our time is about at a close. Um, I don't see any other hands up at the moment. Um, any, you guys have covered an incredible amount of material 
in a really clear way. I want to uh, thank you for that and compliment you on that. Um, any final closing comments before we uh, we end uh, the seminar? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. This is our this is the the first uh, opportunity that we've had to talk more publicly about the work that we've been doing uh, behind the scenes for. Uh, for some time now. Um, there will be more to come. There will be more public uh, 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 discussions uh, and uh, more publications, as uh, Mary has said. So th thank you for the opportunity. It was, it's been great. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. And thanks to everyone who participated and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are, and, and have a good weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.